Hello, my name is Leo Kirchner. I'm a network automation engineer at a company called Network to Code, and uh, I will be telling you about learning to deal with multiple distributed sources of tr uh, data sources to empower your source of truth. So quickly, who's Network to Code? We're a network automation solutions provider, and uh, we have a strong focus on community and open source uh, software. And as such, we uh, host a variety of open source projects on our GitHub organization, and we have a Slack channel at slack.network2code.com where you can come hang out with over 23,000 people interested in network automation from all over the world. So, source of truth, what is it? Imagine you have a house, and this is your actual state, this is what your house looks like, and now you want to um, model how to build that house. So you have to have a blueprint, and this blueprint includes all the details that you need to build said house. So you have the position of the walls, the position of the windows, and which way they swing, and all that jazz. So this is what you could then hand off with all the details needed to a construction company to build your house so, it, so that it looks like the top right picture and not like the bottom right picture. So now we're gonna take that concept and apply it over to our domain of network engineering. Top left, there's a simple configuration snippet, Cisco style from like an access port with a description of CIO port, switchboard access VLAN 100, and a couple of other config items. Now, if we look at it from a point of view, from a source of truth, we could ask the following questions about this. First one could be, when did the description change? And we could also ask, why is it VLAN 100 specifically? Why not VLAN 101? What's so special about VLAN 100? And uh, also, who added the fact that this is an access port? Um, another point is that you want programmatic access for your source of truth. So. In the bottom left, we have a template, and this is uh, a Jinja 2 style template. It's basically the top left snippet, just with the variable bits, uh, variable bits exchanged for this templating style syntax. And then you can take that and add to it the structured data in the middle, right of the plus sign, and what you get is your actual configuration snippet, but you can templatize it, meaning that you could also pass Ethernet 2 in there with a different description and a different VLAN, and you get the same result just for the part you want to configure. So. Of course, you're not only configuring interfaces in your network, but there's a whole other variety of stuff, such as the inventory with device lists and software versions, your DSIM data, your IPAM data, uh, templates we just looked at might be in a different system, we have circuits and a bunch of other stuff we might want to store in our source of truth. So um, that's all quite cool, but then reality hits, and you're going to have a lot of different what we call systems of record, which will be the sources for this data. So you will not have one central system which hosts all this, but you might have a um, CMDB which hosts your inventory. Then you have an IPAM tool which may hold your IPAM, may hold your DSIM data. Then possibly if you have templates, they're on the GitLab or on GitHub, and then you have circuits, possibly an Excel sheet. So this has a couple of consequences which are bad for um, facilitating network automation, such as, for example, incompatible data models. Say, for example, your circuits um, reference the site by its name, so it might be the site name Berlin. And then your uh, IPAM data may reference the site by the name of BER01, which is maybe the site's code. So you have to uh, expensively correlate that data to make it usable in conjunction. And also you might have inconsistent data. So within the same data source, your data might be uh, modeled differently. So that can also cause a couple of problems. And finally, we have the distributed authority. So there's no one place that we can query to get all the information we need. We have to go and query multiple of them. Now, uh, I just the timer hasn't started. I don't know, still says 30 minutes. Anyway, I'll try to keep to the time still. <laughs> no free pass on me. So. Um, what can we do? We can introduce a uh, central database which aggregates all this data. This um, has the upside of enforcing consistency because you have a central schema which deals with all those problems we just looked at. So your data is normalized and you also have a single interface to consume that data from. So you don't have to, from your automation code, call to five different APIs or maybe somehow read an Excel sheet into your code. Um, to maybe build your templates or do whatever else you might want to do with your automation, but you have a single source and you can use maybe a REST API, GraphQL API, whatever else you prefer to feed your automation engine. Now, um, we have a product at Network to Code which is called Nordobot, and uh, we have a plugin for it specifically to facilitate this single source of truth approach. Now, what is Nordobot? It's a source of truth and network automation platform which we launched in 2021 as a fork of uh, the project which is probably known to most of you, Netbox. 
And uh, it's sponsored by us. We have a core team of developers improving it, responding to feature requests and bug reports and the like. And what we want to do with Nordobot is make it um, facilitate automation such that um, it provides the means to do that by, for example, ex uh, panning it with a multitude of apps that we offer. So you have the core side of models inside of Nordobot, but then you can extend that with maybe you want to model the firewall domain, maybe you want to model the BGP domain, possibly you want to generate configuration, some of your source of truth, and we have bits of software that you can install, which are also open source, which can help with that process. And also, if you pre were present for yesterday's uh, Arista workshop, they had a brief mention of Nordobot on the slides, because we have a single source of truth integration with their uh, Cloud Vision portal. So that's another thing we do. Now, there's also a demo you can check out at demo.nordobot.com. You can log in there and play around. It's a couple of plugins installed. might be interesting to take a look. All right, so uh, I'm going to give you guys a quick demo of how this SSOT approach can look in practice. And then uh, we can talk about how that works after that. So I've chosen a, a Deutsche Bahn API, which is the German national railway company, specifically their station data API, which tells me about which um, train stations exist inside of Germany. And um, I have taken the ones from Hamburg, because we're in Hamburg, and the ones from Bremen, because uh, I come from Bremen. And I will now sync them inside of this Nordobot instance. So as you can see, we have sites right here, and there's zero of them in right now. So what I can do is I can go to the uh, plugins and single source of truth dashboard, and I can hit the sync button for the DB station data API to an uh, job. Then this will prompt me for a couple of parameters, such as the dry one, which you don't want to do, because we want to see our changes reflect in the database. So I'm going to hit run job now. And this is now going and querying the station data API from the German National Railway Company and syncing in all the train stations that we have in Hamburg and in Bremen. So I can go click on SSOT sync details now. And we can see that here in this overview, we have 75 items that we found. Does it say 73? 73, sorry. Uh, none were updated and none were deleted. And in the bottom below that, we can see a log of uh, what kind of data it actually got in. But it's more interesting to take a look at this through the normal graphical user interface. So if I go to sites here, I will see that um, we have a bunch of sites in here, which are the train stations from the aforementioned federal states of Germany. And we can also go and deep dive into one of those. And we can find that it has not only picked up the existence of this one, but also some metadata surrounding that. So we have the shipping address, we have GPS coordinates, and so on and so forth. So we've basically taken the data from there which could be the authoritative source on our sites, and send it into our source of truth. So now I'm going to simulate what happens if they um, change the site on the other side. Of course, I only have read access to the uh, API from them, sadly. So I will have to um, change the data on my site. So um, seeing as I just have one hand, I'm just going to delete this description, because typing would be annoying right now. I'm going to update this. And then we're going to run through it again. And what I expect is that uh, the SSOT framework picks up upon the fact that this has been changed and it's going to re-add the description. So we're going to try and do that. And what we should see in the top right in that same window I showed, um, after I click on SSOT sync details, is that we have just one item which was updated. No items created, non-deleted, because we picked up upon the fact, as we can see down here, that the description was deleted and we're going to add it back in. So um, we can do similar things by outright deleting one of those. I'm going to take this one and just delete it. <laughs> Sorry to anyone who's from there. <laughs> and then I'm going to create a new one. I'm just going to call it test. Give it a status. Give it a region. Let's put this one in Hamburg and create it. And what I expect to happen now when I run it the third time is that uh, the train station is reinstated and some poor person can go home after all. Um, while my fake train station will be deleted. So let's uncheck the dry run, run the job now, and we should see that it takes a little while, goes to complete it, click on SSOT sync details, one was created, one was deleted. So it's picked up upon the changes again and resynced the state. All right. So i um, going to go back over to my slides now. Um, not that way. This way. Cool. How does this work on the back end? So there's this library called DivSync, which is in, available on Python's package registry, PyPy, called DivSync, which we have up available on uh, GitHub for you to look at, for you to use. And the good thing is this works without Nordobot. You can use this in 
any Python program. It's not tied to Node, but if you want to develop similar integrations. And what this does, it provides the framework behind this thing, this um, job of taking data from one system which is evolving into another system which is also evolving over time and making sure that the data is synchronized, that the diff, so to speak, is synchronized between them. All right, how can this thing help you? Imagine we have two systems, in both of which um, we want to store IPM data. So the left one might be our source of truth, our single source of truth, while the right one may be our authoritative source for our IPM data. So if we take a look on the left side, we have uh, the CIDR field, which models the prefix, including the submit mask as a uh, with the notation slash 24. On the right side, it's different. We have two fields on the model, and one is the actual network address, the other one is the prefix length. And this is similar for other fields. The VLAN, for example, on the left side is a string type with VLAN 1 to 3 as the value, while the VLAN ID on the right side is just an integer. So these are not compatible, right? This is one of the problems I talked about earlier, where we'd have to write code to make sure that these are synchronized. Now. What this can do is can help you address these questions. What's the difference? How can we load the data? How can we compare the VLAN name and ID, even though they have different data types? What we're going to do is we're going to introduce a central diff sync model, which we can load both sides into. So if you can see from the color coding, from the right side, we have two orange fields loaded into the prefix field. From the left side, we just have the CIDR field. The family field is dropped all together because we can tell from the IP address what the family is, and so on and so forth. And then what we do is we load the data from both systems into that central model that can basically communicate between the two different models. And then we can generate the diff from that, which is what DiffSync does. So you define the model, and then you load your data into it, and then you tell DiffSync, please give me the diff. And that's looking similar to the report I showed earlier with this green and red and yellow stuff down below the job logs. That's the diff. So then at the final step, we want to take that diff and sync it into our systems. And of course, we have to choose because we can't sync to both. That wouldn't make sense. So we uh, choose the desired direction, in this case, syncing to the right system from uh, our authoritative source, so the data source that is actually authoritative for our data set. And then uh, we're done because we have the data in. So a uh, quick tour of the code. And uh, I've written this in about uh, two months, uh, sorry, not two months, two hours, in, in the one morning when I was writing this talk. So uh, with that, I want to go to show that it's fairly easy, provided you have a good API, which I actually think, think this uh, Deutsche Bahn API is fairly well built. Um, it's fairly, easy, fairly, fairly easy to build one of these integrations. So um, this is the model I talked about. So it's the central model that is able to communicate between the two. There's a couple of meta fields on top which, for example, we have a model name. This is just for, for debugging output and the like. We have uh, identifiers, which is the set of fields on the model that uniquely identify this site. So in this case, it's um, the name of our train station and the name of the region of the train station, which in this case is the federal state of Germany. Now, I have not tested this for the entirety of Germany, so if you do uh, get this code from GitHub and change that, I don't... Rec uh, I don't guarantee you that it doesn't break for some uh, other federal state because there might be a difference in natural key there, but at least for Hamburg and Bremen it worked. Now, next to identifiers, we have pieces of data that are just attached to the model that don't constitute its uh, identity. That might be the description, might be the shipping address, and so on and so forth. And um, next to that, we have the fields on the bottom, which is the name as a string type, the description as an optional string type. And uh, these tell the library that is powering DiffSync itself, which is Pydantic, it's a model validation library, um, to validate these fields such that they are actually strings, because that's not something Python itself does. It's uh, something we have to use something else for, because we don't want to be putting integers into some field that uh, uses names. That's going to be a bad time. So we have this class, and what we do is we um, inherit classes for both sides of the system. So we have one inherited class for the station data API, and we have one inherited class for uh, our Nautobot site. And in these classes, we define the create, update, and delete methods to interact with those specific systems. For the station data, as I said, I don't have API access, so these methods look fairly uninteresting. They're just not implemented, so I didn't show them. But I'm going to now go into a little bit of detail on the specific ones for the Nautobot site. So if we take a look at the signature of the function, which is uh, the line where it says def create, we get in a couple of parameters. First of all, we get in the uh, class itself, and then we get in the diffsync instance, so we can load the data into that diffsync instance. And then we get the IDs dictionary, which is a, a key value store, 
that uh, contains the identifiers we looked at earlier. So this would contain name is uh, Hamburg Hauptbahnhof and uh, sorry and uh, region is the federal state of Hamburg. And uh, next to that we get the attributes dictionary, which is the same but just for the attributes I showed earlier. What this allows us to do is in the next line instantiate a new site. And this site object is something that comes from Nordobot. It's a uh, object that is able to translate between Python and the database. So this on this side takes in just normal parameters to a Python class instantiation, and on the other side it creates a database object. So what we do is we just feed all the data in there. At the end we call validated safe. In the last line we hand back off to the distant framework, and that's all we need to do to create our site inside of uh, Nordobot. So update method is even simpler. What we do is we get the site from the database by calling site.objects.get and we pass it the name. And I'm just now realizing, realizing since I said that the region uniquely identifies the site, I should probably also pass the region to this uh, database query, but for the purpose of this example it worked. Um, then we iterate through all the fields and attributes and just set them on that model to update it and finally call save. So we just update every field. As the last one in the triple is the lead one, fairly simple, same code to get it from the database, site.objects.get, and then finally we do site.delete to delete the object. So um, once we have that in place, we have what's called the adapter. So now we know how to manipulate the systems, but what we don't know is how to load the data from the systems. And uh, again, I'm just showing the Nordobot side here because the other side is just a HTTP API with some data mangling, so it's not all that interesting. What we do is we uh, iterate over all the regions in the database and add them with uh, self.add to the different instance. And then we iterate over all the sites in that region. And the same way we take the data from the database. So this is the other way around from the create method, basically, and feed the uh, database fields into the central DivSync model. So we can compare it later with the station data API model. All right, final piece is the actual job class. And this is what, in the end, shows up in the graphical user interface and allows you to run it and sync your data in. And for this, you have to define a bit of metadata. And then finally, you just load the source adapter in, you load the target adapter in, and you're done. The rest is implemented by the framework. So the actual synchronization is not shown here because it's not something you have to implement yourself. You can if you want to extend it, but out of the box, it works. And that's basically the pieces that make this job up. So um, here are a couple of references that uh, I talked about. We have the Slack channel. We have a set of blog posts from us which uh, cover the SSOT topic. We have Nordobot as a open source project. We have the SSOT um, plugin. If for some reason you do actually want to use my piece of software that I wrote, you can also get that from GitHub, but I recommend you don't. And finally, there's DivSync, which is the library I just talked about in the end. And with that, I want to thank you and to ask for any questions. Yes, thank you, Leo, for for uh, for your explanation how Notabot Sync works and uh, how to deal with multiple sources of truth. Um, so, any questions to Leo? does not look like this. Well, then we are easier earlier to the coffee <laughs> or to the next uh, to the next event. So, um, thank you Leo again and thank you. Well, um, thank you. Uh, have a applause for him. Thank you.